Hello, and welcome to Behind the Horror. Scary movie fans, such as myself, will hear that a movie is based on a true story. Now, a few of them we know, but most we never go on to find out just what that true story is. So, in this series, we will explore and find out exactly what the true story is behind the movies we love. The 1996 movie Scream begins with a phone ringing and a young Drew Barrymore answering the phone. She hears the voice of a man who says, who is this and what number did he call? She of course blows him off and hangs up. The phone rings again and the same man is on the phone saying he wants to apologize and he just wants to talk for a second. She hangs up. She begins to make popcorn when the phone rings again and it is the same man. She tells him she's getting ready to watch a scary movie. He asks her what is her favorite and she says Halloween as she plays with this large kitchen knife. He asks her what her name is and she says why. He says quote because I want to know who I'm looking at. She gets scared and she hangs up the phone and it rings again. He tells her if she hangs up on him again, he will gut her like a fish. She's running through the house. She's locking doors and peering out of a window. The doorbell rings and she screams, who's there? The phone rings and the man's voice says, quote, you should never say who's there. Don't you watch scary movies? It's a death wish, unquote. She turns on the outside lights, terrified, and sees her boyfriend bloodied and tied to a chair where he is then disemboweled. The killer, in a full body costume and mask, breaks through a window and grabs her. He stabs her multiple times. He then drags her body through the grass and hangs her from a tree for her parents to find. What happens next? Those of you who have seen the movie know, and the rest will just have to watch to find out. It's more of a nod to the cheesy rules that one must abide by to survive a typical horror movie. You know, like, don't run in high heels, don't do drugs, don't have premarital sex, and so on. But it's still a fun movie. It's worth a watch. So this movie was inspired by the Gainesville Ripper, otherwise known as Danny Rowling. So we're going to have to treat this sort of like we do the regular serial killer podcast because there is a ton of information to go through. So let's start like we usually do. Danny Rowling was born on May 26th, 1954 in Shreveport, Louisiana. His parents were James and Claudia Rowling. Now, James had returned from the Korean War, and he had began dating and eventually married Claudia. They got married in 1953. James was 23 years old, and Claudia was just 19. Two weeks after they were married, Claudia found out she was pregnant, and needless to say, James was not happy. In fact, he beat her regularly during her pregnancy. She attempted to leave, but would come back to her husband each time. James screamed at his wife that he did not want children, and due to the verbal and physical abuse, Claudia's pregnancy was a difficult one. She also had a very difficult labor, and the doctor had to use forceps to help with the delivery. Forceps are what some people jokingly refer to as the salad spoons. But she named her newborn baby Daniel. The abuse that Claudia received from James did not stop after Danny was born, and when the baby was old enough to start crawling, this was the first time documented that James abused his small son. So apparently James was unhappy about the way Danny was crawling and began screaming at him and hitting him. Claudia sat back and watched but felt powerless to stop it. 
terrified at what would happen to her if she stood up for her son. Not to mention she was already freshly pregnant with their second son that she named Kevin. And after Kevin was born, the abuse that was beginning to escalate toward Danny only got worse. Now James got a job and was a police officer and brought the hammer down with complete control over his household. He began enforcing these strict and strange rules, such as absolutely no shoes in the house. The furniture was not to be sat on. Um, eating utensils were to be held in a very specific way. His two sons were absolutely to be quiet at all times. They weren't allowed to sit with him during dinner. Now Claudia attempted to leave James a few more times while the boys were little but always came back, sometimes because she was scared of being a single mother, and other times it was because James begged her to come back, you know, promising he would change, which of course he never did. Claudia stated in later interviews that she did try to protect her sons from their father, but she was just unable to. James would abuse his sons for imagined transgressions, such as not sitting properly and even the way they breathed. They were beat, of course, but it was also known that they were not allowed to cry out in pain or they'd get it even worse. The brunt of the abuse was aimed at Danny and it was almost always daily. When Danny was five years old, his father began to tie him up occasionally for no apparent reason other than to show dominance over his son. Another instance is James found a puppy while out on patrol and brought the puppy home. And Danny loved it, but was forced to watch his father beat this puppy. Neighbors were witness to this. They saw the animal abuse for themselves. The puppy later died from the constant abuse, and some sources say it died in Danny's arms. So when Danny and Kevin got a bit older, they begged their mother to take them and leave and never take James back, but she wouldn't. One story is that when Danny was in third grade during Christmas, James got so abusive that Claudia packed up the boys and left, but she didn't stay gone for long. And after this attempt, she had a nervous breakdown and was hospitalized for a good amount of time. Danny, left at home with his father, was continually, quote, ill and missed quite a bit of school. So the school finally called Claudia and told her that he would have to repeat that year of school and that she should take him for counseling for his constant nervous behavior and personality problems. Of course, she never took him, but his father was happy to belittle him for failing a grade. At just 10 years old, James decided it was time for Danny to learn how to drive at 10, but then slapped him in the face repeatedly for not knowing how to use a clutch. At 11 years old, Danny walked in on his parents fighting and watched his mother slash her own wrists, then lock herself in the bathroom. James literally kicked in the door and just continued yelling at his wife who was bleeding out on the floor. James began beating Claudia and Danny attempted to stop his father but was in turn beat for interfering. Finally, some form of intervention happened and Claudia was taken to the hospital. Now we all wonder when that moment happens in a serial killer. You know, the moment where we all collectively say, you know, yep, that's where his mind snapped. I believe this was that exact moment because after this, Danny began having sexually sadistic and violent fantasies, and he also started drinking heavily. 
Now at just 12 years old, Danny didn't get a haircut for school. So his father beat him with a belt and shaved his head. And of course the kids at school made fun of him. Danny then began playing guitar and writing songs, but of course his father didn't like that either. So James threw his son to the ground. He handcuffed him and he had him thrown in jail for two weeks. 12 years old, guys. At this point, Danny would no longer speak to his mother, or at least very rarely. He even ran away and stayed in some nearby woods. Then he later stated that he, let's say, pleasured himself while thinking about controlling and killing people. But eventually his hunger won out and he had to return home. At 14 years old, Danny reported that he saw a naked girl for the first time, and this led to his new career in being a peeping Tom. He began peering through a neighbor's bathroom window and was caught twice, and the father of the girl that Danny was looking at beat him to the ground. Then when he got home, his father beat him mercilessly. He had had enough and he actually attempted suicide, but it wasn't successful. And he began dreaming of people beating and torturing him with demons going through his body. One time, Danny asked his father if he could be permitted to wear jeans to church. So his father threw him out of the house, but his mother snuck him back in. At 15 years old, Danny bought himself a new guitar and he began writing his own songs while working at a Dairy Queen, but his father forced him to quit because his grades were dropping. People were also beginning to notice that Danny's personality was becoming more dark and aggressive. At 17 years old, Danny began torturing and killing animals and was arrested for being intoxicated. He also openly threatened his father that if he didn't help him sign up for the Navy, he would leave home for good. He had, by this point, dropped out of high school, but he did pass his GED. So, that was his childhood. There's a lot of information here, so let's get into it. It is completely clear that James, Danny's father was very abusive. He apparently didn't want children, and yet Claudia was pregnant as soon as two weeks after getting married. He immediately began to mentally and physically abuse her. Domestic violence during pregnancy is a form of intimate partner violence where the already health risks associated with pregnancy become amplified. The abuse, both physical and verbal, creates negative physical and psychological effects on both the mother and the fetus. Now violence during pregnancy is associated with miscarriage, late prenatal care, babies being stillborn, premature labor, fetal injury, which includes bruising, broken or fractured bones, and low birth weight. Now, guys, side note. Every time I talk about the fact that the fetus can be physically harmed during violence to the mother, someone comes forward to tell me that that is next to impossible due to the uterine and abdominal wall. So, just so we're clear, it is 100% possible for the unborn fetus to experience physical injury while in the womb from abuse happening to the pregnant mother. According to Science Daily, domestic violence can also psychologically affect children before they're born. A new study has linked the abuse of pregnant women with emotional and behavioral trauma symptoms in their children within the first year of their life. Symptoms include nightmares, startling easily, being easily upset by loud noises and bright lights, avoiding physical contact, and even having trouble experiencing enjoyment. You see, 
prenatal abuse could cause changes in the mother's stress response systems, increasing her levels of cortisol, which in turn could increase cortisol levels in the fetus. Now, cortisol is a neurotoxic and has damaging effects on the brain when elevated to excessive levels, which can explain the emotional problems for the baby after it's born. So after Danny was born, the abuse continued against his mother and then extended to him. Now, we are all painfully aware of the effects of child abuse on a child, so we don't need to go into depth on that. Let's just say it's very, very bad. We all know this. We also know that Danny, at about 12 years old, figured out pretty damn quick that he could not count on his mother for support and protection from his father, and that would have fostered a deep distrust and hatred for her, which would be projected onto other people in his adult life. This is also the age where he began to fantasize about violence mixed with sex. We've seen this mixture have devastating effects on the mind. The prime example being Jeffrey Dahmer. We also know that Danny attempted suicide, though how I couldn't find. But this is just a further testament to the deep psychological issues he was facing due to his father's lifelong physical abuse and other exposure to violence. He began drinking heavily as a way to self-medicate to effectively escape. He began displaying very poor impulse control. He was mentally and emotionally immature. His mood begins to darken and it's noticed by everyone around him. And then the torturing and killing of animals begins, which is one of the most telling signs of a very troubled and potentially dangerous person. So Danny attempted to get into the Navy, but failed the test and joined the Air Force instead in Lackland Air Force Base in Texas. He was actually very successful in his military duties, but he also began drinking very heavily as well as experimenting with drugs as this was the early 70s. He was then stationed in Florida and worked as security police and strategic air command and became airman first class. But he was busted with drugs and was locked up for possession of a controlled substance and disobeying orders. He lost a stripe and the military psychiatrist diagnosed him with antisocial personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, and later he was additionally diagnosed with paraphilia. Now, as we've talked about before, people with antisocial personality disorder display antisocial behaviors, deceitfulness, hostility, irresponsibility. They are manipulative. They have poor impulse control, lack of restraint, aggressive. They violate the rights of others and so on. Borderline personality disorder displays as difficulty in regulating one's emotions, impulsivity, irritability, risky behavior, self-destructive behavior, self-harm, social isolation, and so on and so on. He was later given the additional diagnosis of paraphilia, which is a condition characterized by abnormal sexual desires, typically involving extreme or dangerous activities. So by the age of 18, he was honorably discharged due to his diagnosis. After this, he returned to Shreveport to live with a grandfather of his and began attending a Pentecostal church. There, he met his future wife, who he believed God had sent to him personally. They married in 1974, when Danny was 20 years old, and she was already pregnant. <laughs> 
They did have a daughter, Kylie, and Danny had to work two jobs to be able to support his family, which would be hard for anyone, of course. He finally gave in to the pressure of it all and began drinking and using drugs again. His behavior became increasingly irrational to the point that his wife began to fear him. He started threatening her life or he would disappear for hours or sometimes days without a word. In 1976, Danny was caught peeping into a woman's window by a police officer, but that officer just drove him home. Danny told his wife that he was seeing UFOs, demons, ghosts, and even Jesus himself. His wife called his parents to express her concerns. Only his father showed up to the house and put a knife to his throat. Needless to say, his wife never did that again. And in fact, after only two years of marriage, she told him she wanted a divorce. He put a gun to her head and threatened to kill her. He then turned the gun on himself, his wife begging him not to pull the trigger. The divorce was final six months later. The next year, he committed his first rape of a woman that resembled his now ex-wife. He was suicidal and began robbing places stating later he wished someone had just shot him. In 1979, he robbed a Winn-Dixie grocery store in Alabama and left with $800. He robbed another in Georgia, but was arrested not an hour later, and he fully confessed to the robberies. He was ultimately sentenced to two six-year terms, but he seemed to do well while in prison, actually. He had went in a thin and obviously mentally disturbed man, but when his mother went to visit him later, she said he had put on weight, he was working out, he seemed to be more settled. But he was sent out with a road crew to work and he attempted to escape. But only briefly and then of course he had to surrender because the supervising officer fired a warning shot by 1981 26 year old danny had been sent to the bryce mental institute for a few months and the doctors that evaluated him said he was sane and then sent him back to jail only this time he did not acclimate well he spent that Thanksgiving in the hole, or solitary confinement, for fighting. He attempted actually a number of escapes, all of course failed. And then in 1984, he was released from prison after only serving four years. Danny traveled back to Shreveport to see his parents. I don't know why he continued to try to have a relationship with them. But I digress. The peace, of course, didn't last long and his father and him began fighting almost immediately. Danny then began watching a young girl through her window for a few hours one evening. Then he broke into the house with the intent to rape her. She began crying and he stopped because he said he, quote, felt bad. After he hitchhiked for nearly a year becoming a drifter and traveling the country, visiting extended family and staying with them for as long as they would allow. Now, when he landed back in Shreveport, he got a job but was fired for missing three days in a row. On those exact days, three people were murdered, 24-year-old Julie Grisson, her father and her eight-year-old nephew. Danny displayed Julie's body with her legs spread apart and her hair fanned above her head carefully on her bed. He had also bit her on her breasts. Now, Danny was still fighting with his father and as things escalated, Danny raised his gun and shot James in the stomach and in the head, but surprisingly, he lived. 
though he lost an eye and an ear. Danny fled and began recording himself speaking about his life. Some of his recordings talked about how much he hated and loved his father. Finally, Danny landed in Gainesville, Florida, and more specifically, the University of Florida. Under the cover of night in August 1990, he broke into the apartment of 17-year-old Sonia Larson and Christina Powell. He found Christina first, asleep on the couch, and stood over her, watching her sleep. He then silently went upstairs where he found Sonia sleeping in her room. She awoke to him putting tape over her mouth. He then raped her and stabbed her to death. Danny then went back downstairs and taped Christina's mouth shut as well as tying her up. He cut off her clothes with his knife. He sodomized her. He forced her to perform oral sex on him. He then raped her and stabbed her to death. Then he went back upstairs and raped Sonia's lifeless body. He then took his time. He posed the bodies in these sexually suggestive poses. He then took the time to take a shower and then left the apartment throwing evidence away in a dumpster. The next day, he broke into the apartment of 18-year-old Krista Hoyt, then waited for her to return home. Once she returned, he grabbed her from behind and put her in a chokehold. He then taped her mouth shut, he bound her wrists and raped her. And once he was done, he stabbed her to death. He then decapitated her and placed her head on a shelf facing her own body. Two days later, Danny broke into the apartment of 23-year-old Tracy Pauls and her male roommate, Manny. He struggled with Manny, but he did murder him. Now Tracy heard the commotion and sort of stepped out of her room, saw Danny, tried to barricade herself into her room, but Danny busted through the door and did the same to her that he had done to the other women. Then a little over a week later, Danny was arrested on burglary charges in Ocala. They found his tools that matched the type of tools used to break into the campus apartments. They also found that he had been sleeping in a tent in a forested area near the apartment complexes where the attacks happened. He was eventually charged with seven murders. Danny stated he wanted to be famous like Ted Bundy, but he did ultimately plead guilty to the charges. He was executed by lethal injection in October 2006. So guys, this story has everything. Danny most likely had a genetic predisposition to mental illness and violent behavior. He had a passive mother who didn't have the wherewithal to take her sons and leave her violently abusive husband for good. And I have my opinions on that type of situation, but this podcast is not the place. Danny experienced serious stress hormones in the womb, most likely some level of physical trauma while also in the womb, and then verbal, emotional, and physical abuse from the time he was old enough to crawl throughout his life. At what point exactly did anyone think he could have ever been a productive, contributing member of society? He was already diagnosed with a very serious personality disorder at just 15 years old. You know, when you throw these ingredients into a bowl and mix, what you get is some concoction of a vile, morbid, decaying mass that is nothing but poison. <laughs> 
Thanks for listening.